a uh, word in the Bible, P-R-E-S-E-N-T, okay? Now, how do you think, what do you think that word is? I heard several things. It could be present or present, right? The obvious thing is this, present. So, well, I want to look at some things in the Bible about this because of what Paul presents to us in Romans 12. I had a young man call me that last night that was headed for Des Moines, Iowa, on a Greyhound. I said, man, when are you going to get there from Panama City? And he said, well, I think I'll be there tomorrow night sometime. And he is a tattoo specialist. Comes to Panama City, got tattoos all over him. And he asked me something one time. He said, why is my life so troubled? And I said, you're in a volatile thing. Uh, there's a lot of volatility in tattoos and stuff like that. And he, he said, I want to present Christ, but he said, I have a talent in this that pays good money. He said, they pay me $100 an hour. And he said, I couldn't do it in Panama, and they got me a job. And anyway, the long thing is, he said, how much money would it take you to come to Des Moines to teach a Bible class? I said, it's not a matter of money. I said, you have to be there to where uh, it would be worth to come, you know, have a Bible class. I said, I'm not, well, don't, you never heard me say anything about money any anytime. And uh, I said, if you get established up there, you call me, and I'll come up and teach class, and then you can start your one or whatever. But he he don't understand that when you're around those kind of people, they have a different mentality about certain things. And he knows that. But when he came to Bible class, he said, I cannot believe how you people did not reject me. This is talking about Panama class. And that you showed me the love of Christ. And I said, it's not my job to judge you. Uh it's my job to preach the gospel of peace to you. And I got to thinking about this, and he said, I'm not presenting what I should to people. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, what? All right, you present your bodies. There's something that you can present to God in this verse. And it's a living sacrifice. In other words, how you live, your body, you present it to them. Now, I'm not talking about under the law. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. I want you to see this. A living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God made your condition, created a new creature, to where you could actually walk in His good works. Turn to Romans, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Now, I know that what we're in is a vile body. I know that in Romans 7. But as being in a vile body, if we don't have the Spirit of Christ in us, there is nothing we can do that will please God. Now, in Ephesians 2.10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. All right, now, the idea, I want you to turn to Psalm 116. We talked about this the other day. I want to look this again in Psalm 116. Now, the word present or present or present, some of the tenses of it, or uh, presentation. All those words are associated. Uh, to present has to do with a gift or a time or presentation. So, in Psalm 116, in verse 11, no, it's 9, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Now, the word render we talked about, 
the word render has to do with, and if anybody in here would have ever known anything about that, it would have been Harold. Uh, hog rendering. You take a hog, a hog ruins anything he's around land-wise. He'll root and tear it all to pieces. And the Lord even talked about not casting your pearls to swine. And a hog, absolutely, he'll ruin the land. And the only thing that can be good about a hog is when you render him to become food. That's what, that's what my grandma and grandpa always called it, a hog rendering. Well, render, if you put S-U-R on it, means what? Surrender. Now, the hog probably didn't want to be born to surrender up his flesh. You think? It's like these chicken trucks. I see all these chickens in these cages and they're crammed in there and they're, they're going obviously to be slaughtered. And it's saying about a hog, a hog is not, he's not a human being and he doesn't know that his resume is not real good. I mean, his resume is coming to the point he's going to surrender up what he has for humans to consume. And that's the only way he's going to be good is to be rendered from being a living hog that tears up everything he does to being surrendering and being rendered to what he can be useful for. I don't know if I'm making any sense to you, but... This this passage said, What shall I render unto the Lord for all His benefits towards me? Uh, obviously, if you look at Acts 7 and Acts 17, where Stephen and, and Paul preached, the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, and there's nothing that you and I can build Him. I mean, none of these church buildings are the house of God, folks. He didn't. He don't need it. He don't want it. Just forget it. And if you think you can make something to where it can be a worship thing, you're wrong. People talk about the Internet. It's profit in the Lord. Yeah, but look at the other side of it, what it does to people. It consumes people, and so the Lord just lets us use it. All things work together. But it is not the most profitable thing there is. Obviously, the Gospel of Christ. Now, with that in mind, turn with me to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 9. 1 Samuel 9 7. I'm going to look at the, the phrases of present, present, and get an idea of what I want to try to do here because Paul talks about this in 1 Samuel 9 7. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a what? A present to bring the man of God. So this this way, and it's spelled the same, is a gift. Okay? So we can look at that word as a gift. Okay? Now, if you take a present... Obviously, it is pre-sent. It is something that you bought and you pre-sent it. All right. Now, what if whatever I do on earth is pre-sent to the Lord? I mean, it went before us. Okay. Look with me in uh, Judges. Okay, in uh, Judges, let's see, 6. Verse 19, And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, and unleavened cakes of ephah flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot, brought it out unto him under the oak, and what? Okay, he presented it to him. He he brought it to him. He prepared it, and then he did it. 
He delivered it. Okay? Look with me in uh, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 36. There are words in our English language that if you, 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 you know how to say them in the context of how you're saying it. See? Well, he didn't say, present your body of living sacrifice. You would read it and say, present, wouldn't you? See what I'm saying? There's ways that we know because of what we're reading in our mind's eyes how to say that word that's spelled the same and, but yet it doesn't mean the same. Okay? In Jeremiah 36, look with me in verse 7. It may be they will present their supplication. Okay? Now, that's not a physical thing that you could grasp, yet it is likened to the book of Philippians. Turn to the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians... Verse uh, chapter 1 first, and then we'll go to chapter 4. In Philippians 1, verse 27, Only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, understand, your conversation. Uh, people say, well, you can just say anything you want, and it'll be good for doctrine or whatever. I mean, that's the way it sounds on TV and everything. No, he said... In this, only let your conversation be as becometh the gospel of Christ. Okay? Turn to Philippians 4 and go with me to verse 4. I mean, when you're always down and out and never happy about anything, always worrying about everything, what is chapter 4, verse 4 in your life? I mean, that's not, become, that's not becoming of a believer. Are we familiar with that phraseology, becoming? That's not becoming of you. You heard that in your life? Well, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Not not always. Always. In other words, let go of it and let it be. Always. Terminology they use in men and women. Go all the way. We know what those terminologies mean. Well, rejoice in the Lord how long? I mean, you can't go no farther. All the way. Go all the way to the end of the line. Okay? Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is in. Be careful for nothing. That's in the all way. If you don't trust the Lord, it will be known of you. I want you to understand that, folks. If you don't trust the Lord, it will be known of you because you'll have your your holdbacks and your your doubts and whatever. He says, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and what? That supplication is what you present to the Lord. Right? As we read in, in Jeremiah, the present supplications. A supplication is, is is like a request. It's it's to uh, make your supplication uh, uh, enter and uh, entering into the Lord with what you pray about, and on and on. He says, uh, "Be careful with anybody and everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving." What's the thanksgiving involved there? That you can and it will be heard. Have a father. You know that God's listening. Do you trust that? Would you all die? Do you trust that God's listening? Why is it that we repeat? Repetition, vain repetition, which the heathen do. They chant. Folks, God heard you the first time. He already knew what you was going to say. It's your, re- it's a relationship of trusting the Lord. The Lord is letting you in your mind trust Him, supplication, and presenting that supplication to Him. Alright? Now, turn with me to Luke 2. I don't 
maybe I'm, I, I hope I'm getting some order to tell us where we're going to go here. In Luke 2, verse 22. And when the days of her purification, that was Mary. Okay. Everybody there? I heard Paisley turn. All right. And when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses was accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to do what? Now here's a physical act of presenting something to a deity that we know as the Lord. To do whatever will. I don't know if I'm making sense. You realize that in Romans 12, you're supposed to give your living body to God, for that's your reasonable service. Present, isn't that what he said? Did they just present the Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus to the Lord? In doing what? Absolutely, obedience to all righteousness that's to be observed. Now, turn to Acts 9. And of course, in the Old Testament, Samuel's mother did this. And she literally gave her, her flesh, her son, to the Lord. Do you know why she did that? Because he let her have him. I'm, I'm not. I'm, you're looking at me like a knowing headlight. Look, I want you to understand that she prayed and prayed because she didn't have a child. And the Lord told her finally, "You're going to have a child." And later, when the child was born, she presented that child to the Lord because He gave her that child. God gave you life. God gave you His Son, and God gave you a right to cry to Him, what's your reasonable service? Present your body a living sacrifice. Okay? Acts chapter 9, look with me in verse 41. And He gave her His hand, and lift her up, and when she had called the saints and widows... Presented her alive. This is a situation where a woman died. And Peter went in, and the Lord raised her. And in doing so, verse 42 happened. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many what? I, I, am I, I'm not going... Are everybody... Wait, wait, wait. Because of what he did, the Lord, through Peter. Many people believed because He raised the dead. He used Peter, not it wasn't the power of Peter, and Peter knew that, it was the power of the Holy Ghost. And what He did in verse 42, uh, 41, uh, 3, came to pass that He... Uh, I'll get it right here. Verse 41. He gave her His hand and lift her up and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her what? He took what the Lord used to make many believe. Here's a woman that was dead. Now she's what? And Peter took her by the hand and presented her to the saints. And what happened in verse 42? What do you think you're here on earth for? To present what the Lord did for you. It always amazes me. People get saved, but they never give a testimony of it. I love it when people allow me to give a testimony. Say, well, I'm not good at speaking. I bet you you're a liar. I bet you speak every day of your life about something. 
You talk about this, you talk about that, you talk about everything else. But when it comes to talking about your salvation, you clam up. Why? There are men in this church that ought to stand up and give their testimony on a regular basis when people come in new. Why? Testimonies are the greatest thing in the world. It gets people to thinking, hey, I don't have that peace. I don't have that. Why? Why don't I have that? I go to church somewhere, I do this. Why don't I have that? They hear somebody talk about how that they had been religious and they came out of that and for the first time in their life they have peace. They know that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. They know He died for their sins and buried rose again on the third day. And God's satisfied. What would be so hard about that? Come on, talk to me. Huh? Well, it's it's the greatest moment in your life. And this man, Peter, who has the power of the Holy Ghost, went in. And he healed this woman from death. He healed her. No, the Holy Ghost did. But he took her by the hand and he presented the work of God before the saints. And how there was a lot of people believed. Did God make you a new creature? Then present it. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Present that Word. Alright, turn to Galatians chapter 4. Am I making any sense to you folks? Galatians chapter 4. We ain't even got to the heart of it yet. Galatians chapter 4. Verse 18. Be it good to be, I uh, apologize, but it is good to be zealously affected, always in a good thing, and not only when I am, now that's a tense of it to where you're in the presence of someone. You're standing, uh, as it is, alongside. You know, Pray for me this week. I'll be with a man riding that invited me that I've been working on for many years. He goes first Baptist, dumb as a hickory stick. And I deal with him, and he comes to me with questions and not his preacher. And I we're going to be in close quarters riding and be there for two or three days. Maybe I can talk to him. Uh, things come up. I'm not going for that also. I'm going to ride too. I like to ride. That's like a man told me one time. He said, you see that Harley I've got? I bought that to witness the Lord. And I said, you're a cotton-picking liar. You bought that because you wanted to. Got mad at me. I said, you bought that Harley one? You can witness on a bicycle. I see guys trying to do it on black, white shirts and black ties. I wonder why they don't buy Harleys. They ride bicycles with helmets on. I thought, you know, I saw some of them doing that the other day, and I thought, you know, you're knuckleheads. I'd get me a motor. And they go around propagating a message of falseness, accursedness, and I never see grace people out working at it like that. Dedication and zeal does not mean salvation, folks. In this verse in Galatians chapter 4, verse 18, he said, when I'm present with you. If you're present with somebody, you can present something because you're alongside of them. Turn with me to Romans 11. Now, here's an issue of time. In Romans 11, verse Five. Even so, then at this, now if you're not talking about a box present, we're talking about right now. Whenever he wrote that, present what? Is this the 17th of July? That's the present time. It's uh, uh, 11:35. Present time. That's what the word refers to. Is present time. All right, look in Romans 8. Just back up, Romans 8. 
Verse 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So as you suffer, what could you hope for? In the end of the verse, it would be revealed in you. That would be obviously based on the judgment. Well, now, go back to Romans 12. As the guy said, now we're going to preach. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, this verse is a mouthful. Mercies of God. A beseech. Paul, that, that's like a beg. That's like a, a, a pray you would do this. I beseech you by the mercies of God. He's telling look at the mercies of God in your life. Look at what the things have been in your life. In spite of yourself, God has taken care of you. In spite of all the things you've done. You know, people have guilt complexes and, and they, they don't want to look at the Bible and they don't want to listen to the Bible because of their guilt complexes. And Paul is saying, I beseech you by the mercies of God. The mercy of God is you're still alive. You still have a living ability. And the mercies of God have gotten you there. And in in spite of yourself, God is taking care of you. In spite of yourself, Jesus Christ has died for your sins and rose again. So by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, people are always asking, I don't know what the will of God is for me in my life. You just read it. That presenting your body a living sacrifice, you can present to God... His right. I don't know how to say it anymore. His right. Did God son by all men? Did He purchase them? Then you have a right by the mercy of God to present that body to Him. Okay, now watch. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you're proving to the world. Now watch. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. What if God came to visit your house? In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if God was coming to visit you out, the old Baptist thing was I'd hide the Sears catalog. Because it had women's undergarments in it. (laughs) Is there anything in your house that you wouldn't want God to see? Now, what's come to your mind when I said that? What was you taught all your life? Dirty books, wine, or whiskey, cards, wrong kind of records. I mean, I was taught, folks, and probably still is in some of these churches. What would I think it meant? What would I be afraid God would see? In 1 Corinthians 7 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. So I know that's good in order. That's a good statement. Now verse 3. Let the husband, let's begin with him. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Wow, what a word. Due benevolence. Now, what do you use the word due for? Not D-E-W. D-U-E. What do you think in due? Now, if we went back to this hog thing, you really don't want to kill them when they're young, right, Harold? You, you feed them till they get fat. 
the more the bigger they get, then the more meat you're going to get, the more sale you get out of them, whatever. So you waiting for what? Do time, right? Hold there just a minute. Go to Galatians chapter four. And we're not going to use the word do, but we're going to show how the do works. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, all right? Uh, I don't know, Harold, how long did you usually keep a hog before you sold them? Six months. So the due date on them would be six months. Now, that's for sale. What's the due date on on birth? How long did they go on birth? How long did the sow carry? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> three, three, and three, right? <laughs> okay? So, that's another do thing. Okay? The hog do in three months, three days, and three hours. Or no, three, 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 whatever. Okay? But six months, you can sell them if you fed them right and, and whatever. So, we've got do things, right? In this passage here, we've got in Galatians chapter 4, Verse 4, but when the fullness of the time, not times, there's times all in the Bible. But this is the time, this is a specific time. This is what God saw exactly when He's going to do this. So all the things of prophecy and all the things that come together, there was a due time for something to happen. What? But when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. And it has to be made of a woman because the genealogy of Matthew chapter 1 is the genealogy of Joseph and the genealogy of Luke 3 is the genealogy of Mary. Why? Jesus does not come from Joseph. He does not come from an earthly father. He comes from being made of a woman. God made Him a body to dwell in. Are you listening? And He had already had a body for it to dwell in. And that body was Mary. According to this new crap that's come out, why didn't a man carry her? All that crap about homosexuality. Mixed marriages. Phooey. This thing about He sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. In other words, there's specific things about this dude. He's made a, a made body. A body that He can dwell in. Don't you realize you have a body you can dwell in? And that body is to do things for the Lord. Okay? Go back with me to 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 3 again. So we begin with the husband. Husbands, render. Render. What if I put S-U-R on front of it? Surrender what? Do benevolence. You want me to quit now? Do you know what to do means? It means to owe. You owe her something. I wonder what that would be. Well, benevolence has to do with a good mind. It has to do with having your mind right about her. Your mind set on what the role is. I love my wife. I'm the head of the house. I believe in that. But I'd never be cruel to her. And power can be cruelty or it can be right. You'd rather work for a boss that's cruel and powerful or powerful and wise. Now, folks, if he's your boss, he's wise anyway. I mean, they're powerful. He's got power over you. So what you think about do benevolence is he's saying render this, render this do benevolence, this owing of the good mind about it. Now the verse ends in the same thought, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. So what is the wife to render? Do benevolence also. 
In other words, her mind is to be what's due with a good mind. Okay? Are you alright? I mean, he didn't, he didn't just say this husband, he said it in the same verse, in the rotation of it. In other words, the husband is to render due benevolence to the wife, the wife is to render due benevolence to the husband. Okay? Turn with me to, well, you don't have to. Yeah, you do. Ephesians 5. I want you to go there. Hold on to 1 Corinthians. Ephesians chapter 5. Look with me in verse 25. Do benevolence. Here's a word. L O V E. A lot of people that's huggy, mushy, slurpy kind of love has nothing to do with that. In verse 25, it says, Husbands, what? What have you been told to do, husbands? What? Would that be a do benevolence? Well, how do you love your wife? You just lust her? Do you think that she's your shoe tire? Do you think that she's your servant, your slave to do what you tell her to do? Or do you love her and render that to her, that due benevolence? He says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for me. I'd like for you to think in your mind how much Christ loved the church. How much did He love the church? He gave Himself that He might... Deliver. Go to Galatians just a second. Hold, you're going to hold on to Ephesians for a minute. We'll come back. Galatians chapter 1. I think there's a term here that maybe we miss in our married life or in our living in the world as a witness. In Galatians chapter 1, look with me in verse 3. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Would God, if Jesus Christ had not done what He did, would He be ready to kill this world? Would He pour His wrath out on this world? Okay? Somebody asked me, what did you do the, right after you trusted the Lord? I went after Kathy. Why? She was the nearest, dearest thing. I asked a question years ago, and people kind of shunned at it and went crazy over it and didn't know what to do with it. I said, if you and your children and your wife were in the house and it caught on fire, who would you say first? I'd say my wife. And the kids looked at me when I said that, and I said, oh, my God, you don't love me, Daddy. No, I'd save my wife, and maybe she could help me save the children. My wife came first, folks. She came before the children did. And she gave life to my children. And through their, her flesh, my seed came. And folks say, that's cruel, Brother Jerry. You can do whatever you want with it. If that's fine with me. That won't change my mind. But I would save her if I could. And if I couldn't, I would be greatly appreciated to die in there with her. It'd be better to die than not. Somebody says it's a good day to die. Some days are. And there are some things that are good to die for. You want them to die for the Lord? A living sacrifice. You're willing to let God do whatever He wants to do with you and your house. Joshua said, "It's for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Galatians chapter 1, verse 4, who gave Himself. He didn't commit suicide. He didn't do any of that. No, no, no. He gave Himself. There was something that had to be given to satisfy God. I'm pretty sure Romans 12, when Paul wrote that, then that was what God wanted you to give to Him. After you have rendered to Him the cup of salvation by taking it. I'm pretty sure then in Romans 12, 
at being saved, I can present my body a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto Him, which is reasonable service. I, uh, I was at Bible class uh, Thursday night at Mount Ida. And it's just six people. Uh, there's been as many as 20 there, but they come and they go. And the story out now is that that class don't believe in Christmas or Easter. Well, see, they always make that up. They made a, they made a deal about that in Darlington years ago at Dale's house because it was the end of the road, and they made up the story that we were having a beer party every Saturday there. And I knew they were lying because if we was, they'd have been there. And people, you can do good 40 years of your life and do one thing wrong, and all that will be remembered of you is that bad. That's all they'll remember. When you're accusing people, are you accusing them of the bad? Are you praising them in the thing wrong? Very seldom do you praise them of the right. You praise them of the wrong. You, you remember that. Well, here He gave Himself for our sins. What was the only payment that would work? What's the wage of sin? So Jesus Christ was willing to die that you and I might be set free. Am I willing to die that my wife will be set free? Free from judgment. Guess what First Corinthians is about? He gave Himself for our sins that He might present us uh, uh, might deliver us from this present evil world. There's the word present. Present. You understand? Different tense. How do we know to read it present evil world instead of presenting evil world? Because of the context, the way we read the verse. Who gave Himself our sins that He might deliver us from this present evil world. What kind of world we live in? Evil. Was it the will of God and our Father? Go back to Ephesians 5, verse 25 again. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for for it. That's what He said in Galatians chapter 1, right? He gave Himself that the church might be saved. That He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word, that He may present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. I would love for my wife at the judgment seat of Christ to get what I think of her. How many of you ever heard me talk bad about Kathy in your life? You know why? Because I love her. I don't go around, I love you, I love you, I love you. They do that on the phone all the time. My kids and her, I love you, Daddy, I love you, Daddy. Okay. Every once in a while I write that 30-day note. You know, I write, I love you 30 times. I say, here's your 30 days. I'm not a, I'm not the type of friend, I love you, I love you. There are people that I really do love, and there are men that I love. Say, well, are you queer? No, no, no. I've done everything but that. Not guilty. But there are men that I love. I love men the Lord. They do the will of the Lord the best of their ability, and I love them for that. And I love them the fact that they trust a Savior that I love. But I don't like hairy legs. Now, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that He may present it to Himself. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. <clears throat> Turn back to 1 Corinthians 7. Verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. A woman that will deny her husband is not loving and do benevolence, but the husband. Defraud not you, 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 I apologize, I'm going to get back to verse 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. 
And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. That's what you agreed to when you got married. People say, I want to get married. Well, do you like each other? Well, it'll get better when we get married. You've got to be kidding me. Close quarters is going to get better? Kathy's my best friend. She always has been. I loved her from the moment I saw her. Her mother stepped in and broke us up for a little while. We dated. We didn't even date for a month. We've been married 34 years. In spite of Mary Catherine. They said, well, that quick she found to have been pregnant. No, she wasn't pregnant. That wasn't the love I had for her. It was a love sent of God. Am I worthy of it? No. Not in the flesh. But in that new creature, I am. He says in verse if I defraud you not one the other, except it be for, uh, with consent for a time, that, to may, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. Folks, I don't need to interpret that, do I? Somebody says, well, that's, that's not what marriage is. You want to bet? I'll just put it point blank. Cut a man off and see. Men love, but they love things. And if you defraud that, it don't work out too good. Now, who's going to get involved in it? The end of the verse. Now, why is it that Adam ate of the fruit? He didn't stop the first of it. I truly believe in my heart they were headed for the tree of life. Both trees are there. And I believe Satan stepped in and tempted the weaker vessel. And yes, the woman is a weaker vessel. That has nothing to do with strength. It has nothing to do with intelligence, folks. Venus and Mars. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact the weaker vessel has to be helped. And instead of stepping in as he should have, he let it happen and then went along with it. What did it cost us? How many people in 6,000 years did it cost? Death. Wherefore, it's by one man. He didn't blame Adam. He blamed Adam. Why? He didn't step in. The wicker vessel was to be helped. Uh, help me for him was to be helped with due benevolence of love. Hey, I don't want you doing that. God will kill you. That Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency. You all right? Turn with me to First uh, Corinthians eleven. Verse one: Be you followers of me, even as all sin of Christ. Would you want people to know that you're a follower of Christ? Now remember, what would there be in your house if God came to visit that you would be ashamed of? Somebody said, be my TV. Well, if you think so, get rid of it, but I'm not telling you to. I'm pretty sure he'd be ashamed of all that. Now, I'm pretty sure that God doesn't like any of the things we do like that, but that's just flesh. You understand? How many of you in here are worthy of God's mercy? None of us. Not a one. We're not worthy of anything that God ever did for us. It's by grace. Now watch, verse 2. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is what? Okay, men in here, who's your head? Who? Okay, if he's the head, he's the mind. Okay? And the head of the woman is? 
So I'm, I'm going to have to put man under Christ, right? And then obviously then I'm going to have to put all man under there because I can't throw it out of order in the verse. Let's read on. And he said, the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is who? So, I mean, we got it. Uh, hey, kids in here. You're a little old man on the ticket. So, let's put children. Now, what I told you about that burning house, burning house, was I right? Was I right? The next step? I wouldn't have any kids if it wasn't for my wife. I wouldn't have any kids because I wouldn't have any life if it wasn't for... And I wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for God. Okay? He says, the head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. Turn with me to verse 8. For the man is not of the woman. You know, man didn't come from a woman. He came from dirt. The woman came with a man. So she came from a bag of dirt. <laughs> Sorry about that. For well, the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Alright? What did God create man for? To live in his garden. To name the animals. To be in the presence of God. But he couldn't do something. What couldn't he do? He couldn't repopulate or populate. So what did God create? The woman. Oh, there. Just a second. Go to Romans. Look at verse 26, Romans 1, 26. Did I tell you Romans 1? I apologize. Romans 1, verse 25. He said, who changed the truth of God? Is this the truth right here? Okay. To change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affection. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Two women cannot have a child. Bubba somewhere around. I don't care whether it's test tube or whatever, Bubba is around. Two women can't have a child. Well, why do you say that's the natural use, Brother Jerry? Because that's what God created a woman. A woman is a man with a womb. Okay? Verse 27. Likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. Oh, the women hate to hear that today. So they've tried their very best to change that, change the order of God, and try to eliminate, maybe, if he possible, eliminate the man. Well, is that the way God said worship? Is that the way God said serve? Is that the way God said put the house in order? No. Okay? Who changed the truth of God? Why? Verse 27, likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another. Homosexuality! Folks, it doesn't matter what legislation says. It doesn't matter what man says or woman says. It ain't right. And I'm not a harper on homosexuality. Why? I believe the homosexuals ought to be saved. But bless your soul, it ain't the lifestyle of God said. Would that be presenting your body a living sacrifice? No, it wouldn't. Now watch, verse 27. Likewise, the men also leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to what? To do those things which are not convenient or in the closet. Right? Isn't it funny they have to hide it? 
Why don't they hide it anymore? Because the conscience has been seared of America over. And the order is out. There is no order of this. Now, turn with me to Colossians. In the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Verse 20. No, I don't want to go that far. Look with me in verse 17. Colossians 3, 17. Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Boom. 18. Now, before I read this, I want you to read with me Colossians 3, where you're at, verse 24. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. All right, now, who do you face? At the judgment. Okay? Verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he had done, and there's no respect of persons. So don't think that because God loved you more or less. You know, I think about the apostles when they asked, Lord, can we sit on, can this man sit on your right hand? In other words, they, they thought, can I get over there? Not a situation there. There's no respect of persons on this situation. But now go back with me to verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So between verse 17 and 23, I'll bet you put the house in order. I'll bet you he's going to put the house in order because that's the judgment. Now watch this. He says in verse 18, who did he start out with? And there is a key to this. Own. O-W-N. Men rule the world. Men set the rules of the world. Men set monetary rules. They set living rules. They set governmental rules. Now, what you think about this? There are men that set and change the laws to where it's okay for women to do what they think is right. Now, folks, when I get done with it, I hope I get, you understand what I'm saying. In verse 18, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Do you know what that does to you men? You better have a good mind about this. If she's willing to submit to you, your mind better be right on the Lord. You better want that household to be godly, but you better not have it in a power trip. You better not have it in where you just put them under subjection and have a meanness about it. Jesus Christ was not mean in what He did. His love was not mean. It was submissive to the things that God wanted we as men have to submit to the will of God so that our household good judgment of it. Now watch this. Wives, submit yourselves unto what? Not somebody else. You don't have to submit to no other men in that situation. Why? It's your house you're living in. You know, and by the way, women are the, the keepers of the house. I don't need to tell Kathy how to keep the house. I don't need to tell her what to cook. I don't need to tell her any of that. She is very smart. She knows how to do it. Best cook in the world as far as I'm concerned. I don't need to tell her all that. What I need to tell her about is the will of God. But if she's going to come to me, I have to be ready for it. For I'm her own husband. Verse 19. Isn't it amazing how God keeps telling us to love? Oh, we're ornery. Ooh, men are ornery. Power trippers. 
egomaniacs, testosteroners. We get hateful and ornery. And we have to sacrifice that. We have to die to that in love. I delivered Marybeth when she was born. I was in the hospital. I was in the room with all of them. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't even let me touch Robin when she was born. I thought, I have some kind of disease. And then Susie, they let me get a little closer to her. But I actually delivered Marybeth. And as I delivered Mary Beth, I thought what my wife went through to have that child. And I thought, boy, I'm a bad dude. To even think that I have some pain. I can live with the pain I've got usually because I think about what she goes through. I'm the pain in the side. I'm pretty sure I might be the messenger of Satan, the thorn in the flesh, the buffeter. Man, I look at a woman, she works how many hours a day? A man works eight hours, he's going, man, I've had a rough one today. Uh, well, just sit down, honey. I'll get you, I'm getting you supper cooked. And then when the supper's over, he's in the, in the recliner asleep, she's washing dishes, and then she got to do something else. And she may go out and work if that's what he wants. And folks, I never give it to you and the wife on that. That's your decision. If you want her to stay home, you tell her. If you want her to work, that's fine. I can tell you what the Bible says, keep her at home. But the world has made it to where you can't. No, it's made it to where you think you can't. That's where it comes down to. And she's working while you're going. And she wakes you up to go to bed. So... Her work is hardly ever done, and yet you think you're the one. Or you got some kind of miserable little pain. Give me a break, you big sissy. Women hurt a lot of times and don't even tell their husbands. They just go on about what they do. And we're over there going, Oh, my toe hurts, or my belly hurts, or my back hurts, and all that. Well, carry me around for a while. She carried the babies nine months. I carried them 40 years. Just kidding. But hey, that nine months of carrying and that delivery are to open your eyes, buddy. What a woman goes through. And then all the tears and all the unhappiness dealt with children and husbands to them. And if they go through it, why wouldn't you love them? Now watch. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Uh Uh-oh. Children. Obey your parents in how much? For this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And of course, Ephesians chapter 6 has to do with wrath. Same type of verse. Servants, obey in all things your masters. You bunch of miserable grace believers that gripe about your job, gripe and moan. You took the job. If you're going to work for a penny, you're going to get paid a penny. If you want something else, get something else. But while you're working, quit your griping. So what's the matter with America? Gripe, 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 gripe. Bitch, bitch, bitch. Moan, moan, moan. Dispute, dispute, dispute. I'm worth more than that. You ain't worth nothing. We ought to be in the depths of hell. God lets us live and breathe His air and see the beauty of His world and trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be in liberty and be redeemed. He said, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. Fearing who? Oh my God, folks, it never got out of order. If God is the head and Christ is our head, then man, look at it that way. Then what shows up in verse 23 again? Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, 
and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Who do you serve? Who? The Lord Christ. Who do you answer to? Then present. Send up a present work. Is everybody okay? I appreciate you being here today.